Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our last segment of the day. Thanks so much for sticking around. Um, just a quick reminder, um, drinks are after this. So get excited, this is gonna be, if not the best segment of the day, equally tied with all the other segments for best of the day. Oh. Yes, um, Ravens Club, it's downtown, so it's about what, a 10 minute walk from here. On Main Street, yep. So it's, what is it next to? You can Google it. We'll all walk over together, so we'll, there'll be a, a migration. Um, gonna introduce these fine folks uh, here. Um, but before I do, I wanna say a special thank you to Elizabeth. Um, we spoke over the summer when this symposium was just like a ba baby idea, um, and she had, was a real guide in helping to find um, great folks that would be panelists, um, helped shape some of the ideas that went into each of these. And so we're really grateful um, to you and for your input and, and your guidance. Thanks. Um, this is Elizabeth Khalil. Uh, she spent her career as an attorney focusing on bank regulatory compliance and risk management with a particular concentration on privacy and emerging technology. She's a former federal uh, banking regulator, having served in the office of the Comptroller of the Currency and FDIC in Washington, D.C. In private practice, as a partner at Dykema Gossett and senior associate at Hogan Levels, she advised numerous banks, credit unions, and fintech companies. She now focuses on retail and consumer issues, including digital initiatives at CIBC in Chicago. To her right is uh, Matt Homer. Until recently, Matt was head of policy and research at Quovo, a fintech data connectivity platform. He previously served in government at the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and U.S. With agents Elizabeth. With, with Elizabeth yeah. together. Yeah. What a team. Yeah. Amazing. Um, at USAID, he developed two innovation programs. The first was a partnership between the U.S. government and Government of India to promote payment innovations that would lead to greater financial inclusion and improved lives for ordinary Indians. The second, the RegTech for Regulators Accelerator, was a first-of-its-kind accelerator program designed exclusively for regulators in order to help them test new technologies. Matt recently also supported the stand-up of a new Rockefeller-supported effort focused on helping policymakers in emerging markets build new digital infrastructure and pursue efforts that give individuals more agency over their data. As part of this, he embedded with the team in India that built the country's digital identity program and India Stack. So please join me in welcoming our final panelists. Thank you so much. It's um, great to be back at my alma mater, uh, Michigan Law, and be inside this beautiful new building for the first time. It's great. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for um, having me and having us. So Matt and I thought that we would wrap up by kind of um, highlighting some key themes and issues that we saw um, as kind of threads throughout um, today's discussion. And um, one thing that I noticed in particular is how great it is to have all these great sort of minds together in one room to talk about these issues holistically. Um, because as somebody who's kind of grown up her career alongside a lot of our financial privacy laws and regulations, um, I, I can tell you that that hasn't really been the underlying sort of underpinning of our financial privacy um, legal regime in this country. So um, as I was coming out of law school in 2002, um, we had the Graham Leach Bliley Act, um, privacy and data security laws, regulations and uh, law regulations and guidelines um, coming online. We were about to see the FACT Act, which amended the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, so we have this sort of um, kind of patchwork of laws and regulations uh, affecting privacy and data security in this country. We didn't really go into a lot of depth as to what the current kind of lay of the land is legally uh, in this country, but just to kind of give you a, a snapshot of that and where these discussions kind of, um, the backdrop against which these discussions happen, we have no one consistent, generally applicable, comprehensive privacy and or data security law regulation in the US. We have mostly a sectoral approach, so there's health privacy, financial privacy, and so on, and then some federal laws and regulations that sort of apply more generally. There's no one comprehensive framework. The laws that we have in some cases have kind of reacted to certain situations, concerns that were happening at that time. So 1970, we have concerns about 
um, credit reporting, consumer reporting agencies, aggregators of consumer data, so we get the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, Graham-Leach-Bliley Act happening in 1999, expanding the powers of financial institutions and um, as a little bit of trade-off and in, partly in response to a member of Congress's concern about um, his credit union possibly selling his contact information to Victoria's Secret Lingerie Catalog, we get, um, we, we get a little bit of data protection um, for consumers as part of that law. So we haven't really sat down and had sort of all the key stakeholders at the table and thought really comprehensively from square one about um, financial privacy and data security. So here in this kind of symposium, we have the luxury of thinking from the ground up what, what are the important principles that we would, we would want covered um, in sort of a new regime that covers um, financial information, whether it's you know, the magical dust of fintech or uh, whatever it, it was called or um, other uh, products and services that happen to um, incorporate financial information of consumers. So I think um, that, that is something really great and that, um, that framework is really helpful and, and would be great for um, any actual decision makers to, to use to incorporate into a you know, new legal or a regulatory regime here. So kind of building on that, um, one kind of thread and concept that we wanted to talk about is the, the philosophy of privacy, kind of um, what are our privacy values as a nation and how does this relate to financial information in particular. So Professor Barr um, teed up that issue at the beginning of the day and saying that, you know, we haven't really thought, again, from square one as a, as a country, what are our privacy values, um, you know, and kind of what is our, what is our philosophy there. Um, so I don't know if Matt, you want to jump in with some thoughts there. I mean, there's a, yeah, I was just kind of reminded of some statistics um, when, when Mike, when Michael teed up that question. So the Clearinghouse, um, which is uh, an association of banks, they put out a survey last year on, on fintechs and have found, this is not going to be surprising to you, found that 99% of, of respondents said they, they are concerned about data privacy. And 67% of respondents said that they are either extremely uh, concerned or, or very concerned. Yet in that same survey, it found that a vast majority of respondents feel comfortable sharing their mobile phone number, their email address, um, their physical address, and their date of birth. Um, so I, I think that it really highlights that there's a paradox um, you know, in America when it comes to privacy. We say we really care about privacy, and yet our, our behavior and our actions don't necessarily reflect, uh, reflect that. And I think part of that can be explained um, through some other survey work, which finds that people also don't see, um, they, they, don't, they don't see any contradiction between convenience and, and privacy. So they, people believe that they can have maximum convenience with maximum privacy, and they believe technology can be a means of helping them accomplish that. I think that's also true, but I but 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 the, I think the challenge is that consumers are not really voting with their feet to force some some action there. And I think this also relates to some issues that um, have been discussed throughout the day about what consumers are informed about and what choices they're given. Um, so often, you know, we hear well, consumers don't don't really care about privacy, or in the U.S. they don't care about privacy. There's not like this underlying passionate. Um, you know, commitment to privacy like there is in Europe or, um, you know, under the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act um, privacy rule, you have a, a notice and opt-out regime. So basically, there's, there's not really affirmative consent um, that's required there. It's more a uh, financial institution has to disclose certain things about what it's doing with consumer information. The consumer has to have um, an opportunity to opt out of that use. Um, and that's not that's not really consent. That's sort of an opportunity to um, to not consent. And so, very very few people statistically um, use that opportunity to opt out. So some conclude, you know, people don't really care. And again, as we've heard many times today, people people don't read privacy notices. Well, is, does that say that people don't care about privacy, or is that you know they're not being given meaningful information and they're not being given a meaningful opportunity to control what happens to their data because GLIBA notice and um, an opt out is not the kind of you know robust um, you know transparency information consent regime that that we've been talking about. The what has to be disclosed under that regime is 
pretty minimal in the sense of, um, you know, sort of general categories of use of data. It doesn't get super granular into what the financial institution is doing um, exactly with the data. So when people aren't, you know, as informed as they could be in the first place, um, and then, you know, they're not, they're not allowed to sort of affirmatively be able to consent to every use of it. It's just, you know, here are these general categories and do you want to opt out? Uh, it's important to realize, that, like, that is the regime. That's what's being given to consumers. That's what's sort of, you know, take it or leave it. That's what we have right now. Yeah, and I, I think that actually illustrates sort of a broader point, which is that there's a difference between having certain rights over your data and being able to exercise those rights. And mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, the, the gap between those two things is particularly enormous um, when you go to developing or emerging markets, right, where um, I think there's a, a strong desire in, in many of these markets are looking to GDPR as sort of the model that they want to follow, yet there's real, a real question in those markets about whether the government has the capacity um, to, to make those, those rights meaningful um, to consumers. And I think that, um, I, I, I think as a result of that, you know, you're going to see a lot of interesting innovation actually come out of, of emerging markets. Um, India, where I've spent a lot of the last four or five years of my career, I think is interesting. Um, they're considering new privacy rules. Um, and at the same time, there's a group of technologists that are considering technology standards that would accompany those privacy rules. So the idea is that rulemaking, uh, particularly in sort of a low capacity environment, is not sufficient to enable consumers to exercise these rights, but the consumers actually need some more tangible uh, set of tools uh, to make those rights, rights meaningful. Um, and, and we could talk about what those things could be. It's sort of improved permissioning, improved consent flows, um, data uh, sort of data command centers, or whatever you may want to call it, a place where you can go to actually proactively manage your data and your, consents, your consent afterward. As well as I think Sean mentioned something really important, um, you know, which is the idea of a fiduciary standard too for some of these companies, that, the, that you would shift some of the liability from the consumer to the companies holding their data um, and try to make data become seen or perceived as more of a liability than an asset for companies. I, th I think you're absolutely going to see that um, in emerging markets. Um, and also in, in terms of, um, you know, control over your data, affirmative power over your data, um, again, that goes to um, sort of the, the fundamental setup of our financial privacy framework that we have right now. It's very, very different from what we have right now. It's sort of this concept of transparency, a, a type of transparency. This is what we're doing sort of in general categories, FYI. You know, and here's a long privacy policy that we, uh, we sort of describe what we do, but it, is it really helpful or meaningful? And you know, it's sort of FYI, take it or leave it. We we've, we've done what we what we can do, and now we're moving on. So it's it's just it's a very fundamental sea change. And so just thinking about in practical terms how, like how that changes, how does that work? Is that you know you have to get the buy-in of is Congress, you know, banking regular who you know all the stakeholders that need to be part of that, you know who needs to be at the table, mm -hmm. and you know so far it's really it's been very piecemeal in terms of who has been involved. Yeah, I think one way of sort of thinking about the problems, I, I, so I'm kind of the belief you can bucket the problems into two big categories. So one is, is, is our, our informational, information asymmetries that exist between consumers and those who hold their data. And the second category is power asymmetries that exist between consumers and those who control their data. And I think that there's a real, I mean, to, you know, I think that with consent, it's an interesting topic. There was uh, the, the New York Times a couple of weeks ago published an op-ed, or an, an editorial actually, the headline of which was putting the con in consent, right? And basically making the case that, that con and, and sort of drawing on recent examples from, from, from large tech companies that consent is basically, you know, completely meaningless, right? Um, and that even when people do consent, there's no way they can ever be expected to understand what that, what that consent means. Um, and that, if, if that's true here, it's particularly true in, in other markets where people may not be able to read, right? Or they may not be able to, uh, you know, uh, be able to even sort of understand some of the terms, even if they're if it's, if, if they're read to them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that um, when it, but so, but if you get to the broader point of solving the information asymmetry, um, I think it just highlights the need to think beyond consent as we understand it now to other methods of of solving that that problem. 
And uh, Professor Barr also teed up the idea of um, perhaps thinking of, you know, things that you can't get consent to, where setting right. substantive limits on using certain, uh, using information certain ways or certain types of information. Um, but again, I think it's important to remember that basically we do not have a consent regime generally here with regard to privacy generally. Um, in some cases, certain types of consent are needed. In other cases, it's again, it's, it's opt out. It's, it's not exactly the type of consent that one might think of in, you know, whether it's a, it's a GDPR yeah. context or some other context. Yeah, and there, there are also no required disclosure form. I mean, there may be dis required disclosures for very specific sectors or use cases, um, but someone previously mentioned the idea of a Schumer box for data. There's no requirement for something like that. And I think even in, in a digital environment, we could probably start with a, with a Schumer box, which is a, you know, just sort of a generic uh, or a, a, a standard template upon which a consumer could see data in the same way across different institutions to enable apples to apples comparisons between multiple products. You could envision something like that, but I think frankly, um, technology also makes it possible to take a step further and think about dynamic Schumer boxes, right? So a consumer could have a dynamic disclosure they could go to at any single time and it's updated to that current minute to tell them how their data has been used, who it's been shared with, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, we have the, the model privacy notice, which is sort of a safe harbor um, form of disclosure that incorporates Graham Leach Bliley and Fair Credit Reporting Act um, disclosures. But again, as I was saying, it, I mean, it is sort of general, like more general categories of use of covered data. Um, so it has sort of in format, it's sort of Schumer box-like, um, but you know, again, you're talking about getting much more um, specific, granular, and even dynamic in the actual mm -hmm. content of it. Um, so those are some of the, kind of the, the key kind of themes you wanted to talk about. Um, we could talk about this kind of all, all day, since obviously we have been talking about these issues yeah. all day. Um, well, the, one, the last oh, thing I oh, mentioned, just like on, so thing. I mean, you know, if we kind of, I spoke a little bit about the information asymmetry. I think the other side of it is the, is the power asymmetry and, and how do you solve that? And, um, and I think the, the point was made earlier that I think is right, that even if you can, even if you can level sort of the bargaining power between the parties, it may not even solve the problem. Um, but I think that there are some interesting things happening around these that I wanted to mention from India. One is that they are, that the Reserve Bank of India is experimenting, they have, they're, they're actually moving forward and have, have licensed entities that are, that they're calling account aggregators, which are, I would describe as consent intermediaries. So the idea is if I'm a consumer and I'm doing business with a, a bank, a consent intermediary would sit between us to collect my consent. Um, and that's their sole sort of job is, is to manage consumer consent. And then that becomes the place I can go afterwards to revoke my consent and to see my consent um, you know, across the landscape of, of uh, financial institutions um, and to modify or, or revoke my consent. So I think that's, I think that's an interesting model. I think it, even, even outside of sort of a formal licensing regime, you could imagine kind of consent intermediaries paying an important role going forward. Um, and then the second thing they're doing in India that, that, is, that is related is um, creating a, a digital locker functionality uh, where it, it's sort of a single point of access for anyone in the country to access their information. Um, it's not centrally stored, it's connected via APIs to the actual data sources. They're starting with government data, so it's a single place you could go to get your driver's license, to get your business license, to get your birth certificate. Um, which is which can be um, quite quite important um, for then getting loans or things like that. But it, it's not just a place to access it. You can then also permission it, right? So you could go there and permission your business license to a lender. The lender would see that that is actually certified as authentic by the government. So they're starting with these types of government data, but then they'll be adding. The plan is to add in other types of then regulated data, which include health data, financial data, etc. So I think that's also. Um, an interesting model, and I, I'm kind of of the belief that, um, you know, if you're never going to be able to perfect consent, you should at least build tools that enable consumers to exert more control over the data when they need to at the right point in time. Um, I think we all know that when we use apps, people, you know, we're often trying to click through kind of the onboarding process as quickly as possible to get where we want to be. 
Um, but then when something goes wrong or there's a data breach, there are sort of key moments in our life where we actually do want to exert control, right? And so that functionality needs to be there in place when we need it. Anything else? <laughs> no. um, well, we have some audience polling questions to enter the, the second phase of our closing remarks. So would you, would you like to? Yeah. I need to get a clicker. All right, so this is where we're going to use the clickers. Okay, um, let me just get this set up here. So it's pretty self-explanatory. I think you just you just push the. You, you probably have to turn it on. We'll be try. We, so if you use your front thumbprint, it's capturing your biometric um, and, and pulling it in. We're, uh, so yeah, turn it on, and then uh, let me c click start, and then you just read the question and, and respond. Is it encoded in my DNA? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll tell you later. <laughs> you can go ahead and start, yeah. So it looks like we've got nine responses, 12. It was, it was all disclosed when you enrolled in the symposium. It was very when you symbolic. clicked when you accept up. to come accept, in. Accept, yeah. <laughs> By this time next year, Americans will have A, more control over their data, B, about the same level of control over their data, or C, less control over their data. All right, let's, let's uh, give it until it says 45 seconds on the clock, and then we'll stop. All right. All right, interesting. Okay, so less control over their data. Um, and then someone selected option D. <laughs> um, I don't know, would, could, would someone like to share who, who, who uh, voted for less control over their data, why, why they feel that way? Yeah, we'll start here. I think the growth in the volume of data is you know, going to continue to accelerate. That means that the second derivative continues to be positive. Yeah. Hmm. Anyone who's, who said there'd be more control would be willing to rebut that. <laughs> All right. D, All right. How about the, D? Who is D? Yeah, was, was D, if D was intentional, would you like to describe your thinking? <laughs> All right, okay, so, um, all right, so pretty not super optimistic here, but, uh, <laughs> all right, I have to figure out how to reset this. Okay. I'll show you the next question so you can start. All right, here we go. Oh. Uh, when it comes to sharing personal data, consent is A, useful but can be improved, B, useful but insufficient, C, ineffective and should be replaced with something else, D, ineffective but nothing else is better. All right, looks like we're still waiting on a few, all right. All right, we'll give it to 45 seconds. Okay, okay, so let's see here. Yeah, another, so we need to find out who's, who's, who's voting E on all this stuff. Um, I, I wish we were capturing biometrics now. <laughs> um, so for C, should be replaced with something else. Does, so seven people voted for that. Does anyone have, th those of you who voted for that, do you have any ideas of what might be better? Yeah. Right. It's either do without the service or, 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 or accept the terms. So, I mean, if that's the case, you know, it's not really that meaningful. 
Right. Yeah. So what? How would what, how would you? What would be your solu golden solution? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if there is a golden solution. Uh, the, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, obviously with the, the blockchain technology now giving people the capacity to have digital avatars, for example, where they can kind of you know expose certain certain elements of their online presence versus others. Uh, hmm. I think that opens up uh, quite a few possibilities with people hmm. being able to actually you know negotiate online in terms of saying, okay, I agree to share my data only so far. And yeah. Change the service. Hmm. So, I mean, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it's um, there's this concept of tiered KYC that exists in some markets, right? That um, and you could imagine something around these issues generally, right? Um, was there an, another comment? Um, anyone who wants to comment on how um, consent could be improved? Well, that's, that's interesting. That's another idea that comes from other markets, is a concept of a learned intermediary, right? And yeah. that you can rely on a learned intermediary. Right, right. Um, so even if it's digital, even if right. it's algorithmic, what, how is that paid for? And, you know, and structured in a way that's meaningful, yeah. that it's either consent or explanation or comparison yeah. shopping. And even what, in the health privacy context, uh, consent, they've run into issues here and there with that. With, uh, business model? Well, yeah, right. with going with like going going beyond, you know, what was consented to in a yeah. procedure. Yeah, it just feels like we should. Explain. Yeah, the business model is a good question, mm -hmm. um, and I think that the, the model I mentioned in India, there have been questions about whether the business model has been clipped too much and how. Well, I think I think what's emerged so far, I think at least one of the companies that's been licensed is a is a bank utility. So similar to the way Visa or Mastercard started, right? Like com like banks would come together and form a joint venture, realizing that it's more efficient. I mean, con consent should not be, it, you know, it, it could be something on which they could collaborate, right? In that in that way, so you could envision a utility model. But um, so I think this conference every three years, right? So about three years from now, we'll probably have have an answer. Yeah. So. Um, Yeah, I think I think getting money from consumers would not be. I, I just don't know how many consumers would actually pay. But you could imagine value-added services like insurance, right? I mean, this could be tied to some sort of insurance product that. You know. so Yeah, so you're right. I mean, there, so that would be a fun thing to explore in a session is kind of the business models and, and revenue. Um, any other thoughts on this one before we move to the next? Just, you know, yeah. extending what we said over here, you know, um, in terms of paying in cash, consumers might be willing to pay or to disclose more because they got more benefit out of the, mm -hmm. you know, out of the, of whatever they were mm -hmm. getting instead of right, just having a one-size-fits-all model oh, just Yeah, interesting. Okay. Was there a comment up here? Is there? Okay. Well, can I jump on that yeah. real quick? Because I've been wanting to see this all day, which is we, especially in the financial services regulatory environment, think about the value of data for risk mitigation on the industry side. I hate these things, by the way. Aren't I loud enough as it is? <laughs> We're, we're not sort of stepping back and thinking about the value. We are, but we're not sort of as explicitly about the value of risk mitigation on the consumer side. And how are we thinking about mm. policy societal objectives 
where at some level, Christine, you said it, right? The bargain, what's the trade-off? What's the give to get? If we're thinking about assuming we don't already see industry using lots of data for risk mitigation. We want to make that more affirmative in the way like we're researching it around cash flow. What about thinking about obligations on entities that are getting the value of that data, that they then have the obligation of making sure that it is, at some level, improving consumer financial well-being? Pick your context, but that there is a give to get in a really explicit way and that we, society, is thinking about how is this being structured so that it is beneficial on both sides of the coin. So, Melissa, that hasn't come up yet, but would the CRA be an example? And that was, that's, I thought about that, right? Do we give credit? But on the other hand, I mean, do we have problem, to give credit? Yeah, part of the I pointed out that you know, FinTech is focused, right? We have geographically, it's hard to identify. So, what, how do we think about the CRA? And it does consider it in populations, LMI. Right. My but colleague, both. My yes. colleague Larry White has written on uh, yeah. some of those things. And, and I think we need to have a better way of thinking about a lot of those issues. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Do I need you, to leave for my phone or can I just talk really loud? <laughs> just go. You can uh, just go. Right. <laughs> just two quick points. Um, I mentioned the digital standard during the, when I was on the panel. And one of its elements is every piece of information collected about me accrues to my benefit. It's stated a little bit differently, but it gets to that idea, right? And then there's this other idea that's been uh, sort of subliminal part of our conversation throughout the day, which is ultimately is privacy only for rich people, right? So you look at what's gone on in California where you have the CCPA that actually enshrines in law your right to charge people more if they opt out of data sharing, right? And so when we look at, at um, as we're thinking about this conversation, I think we also need to think about the ethical elements, right? And I think it absolutely gets to Melissa's point. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, I opt out of data sharing every time I can, and you got to imagine that the people who aren't aware of being able to do that are the ones who are providing the data to enable these services to be improved. So are kind of those who are better off, right, benefiting from, from those. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, all right, we're going to move to the next one. Let me uh, and let me show it. Let me shut this. Uh, over the next few years, who is most likely to have the biggest positive impact on the ability of U.S. individuals to exert greater control over their data? A. U.S. Congress. B. State lawmakers. C. Private sector companies. D. Federal regulators. And E. For you E people out there, you person out there, we have an E this time. <laughs> Other. If you select E, you have to tell us who the yeah. other is. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, private sector <laughs> companies. Wow. Um, does it, who, who wants to tell us about that? What company and what are they going to do? And you think that'll be driven more by reputational mm -hmm. concerns, or, or more mm -hmm. by legis like more yeah. by reputation? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So it's all. So you look at it from both perspectives of being customer centric, right? Again, it goes to if you and a lot of good, a lot of not good, but a lot of bigger companies with big brands are going to think about it from a customer lens, right? And say, 
okay, how do we, what are the values that we're going to bring to our customers? How do we ensure that we gain the trust of our customers? Um, and so what is a way that we could distinguish from some of the other players who are getting really dinged mm. left and right? Like, uh, how, how do we not become them? Or how do we do better, yeah. right? I think that there could be, and also I see a lot of companies mm. getting together to talk about this. Um, yeah. In some of the other areas, I think it's a little bit too slow, potentially. Right? Mm -hmm. so. And it's just amazing. Right. Three years ago, you go to a client and maybe you talk to the privacy mm -hmm. lawyer and a few other people who cared about privacy. Now it's a C-suite level issue, um, yeah. pretty much across the board. So there's, mm -hmm. you know, from the top down. And I'm not not to say that it's perfect, and not to say that all companies mm -hmm. are this way, but I do think there's the most ability for effective and meaningful consumer choice if it's between the consumer and the companies that can make actually share their data yeah. and interact. Mm -hmm. Right. Because only they can understand the value proposition of giving their data because they're interacting directly with that company. Yeah. I think that's great to hear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I hope and pray that that's what's going to happen. I was glad that nobody picked A because I was <laughs> 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 reflecting our earlier conversation. <laughs> Oh, in courts. Oh, interesting. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Okay. I heard. I heard some conversation over here during this question. What did you guys? Courts. Uh, 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 oh, courts? courts? Okay. Okay. So, Makes sense. Can Big Bang say more about courts? What's that? Why do you think it's courts? Why? Yeah. Because, you know, as much as I would like to think that companies are going to get religion and they're going to build brand and all those neat things, um, I think that, you know, there's just going to be, there's, there's an asymmetry mm. in what Matt talked about between convenience um, and protection. Mm. The asymmetry is, hey, you know, I want convenience and I want protection. But as soon as things go wrong, that's when I'm going to go mm. for the protection side of the scale. And that's what's going to go to the courts. Mm. It's going to be litigated and there'll be lawsuits. And so under what that, under what legal theory, like under what laws? Legal, like, are, legal. Yeah. Well, that, that's a great question because given the ambiguity in our, in our societal ambiguity. Yeah, it's not clear that there are actual violations going on of what the actual law is because the actual law allows for so much already, right? So so which are you thinking of particular specific laws or well, you more guys are the lawyers. So <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I'm yeah. just saying. A taking? A taking? Yeah, so like a constitu constitutional theory. I bet it gets as, as, it has to be something so big and class action because you're right, there's no defined law and there's no private right of action under no. like GLEBA or... Be, and so everybody has to have standing, right? Mm. Everybody. And so it has to be something like mm. that. Mm. Yeah. Because that's what's going to happen. Sean, were you going to... Yeah, I, mean, uh, I think that's critical. I think the critical court thing is going to be around um, standing and mm. whether there's an actual injury that's attached mm. even when there's no Like a Spokio kind of... What's that? Spokio. So it'll be interesting to see how, how much fine FTC is going to levy on, uh, on Facebook. No matter how much money they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna, uh, collect, it's going to be dropped in the bucket from Facebook, Facebook's perspective. So yeah. I, I, just, I just don't have confidence that that's uh, so going to change anything right now. Yeah, but Dan, what you're saying is that Facebook thinks the fines are just a cost of doing this. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're, they're not going to be deterred by having to pay the fines. So I mean, so, so it's more like injunctive relief, maybe. I'm like just talking about probably because I, I I picked uh, 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 C. Uh, I mean, I don't expect mm -hmm. these big tech companies to change their behavior whatsoever, unless there's somebody in the in the first category, A category, you know, make some moves there, which mm -hmm. nobody believes they're going to do. Um, but I, I do think in the in the financial services sector, I think the situation is a bit different. I mean, mm -hmm. Dick, in your presentation, you, you mentioned you know uh, ES. So there, there, there is some, I would say consensus, there's no consensus whatsoever, but at least there is a forum where 
incumbents, you know, Wells Fargo, Chase of the World, and uh, tiny companies, fintechs, and uh, you know, uh, the, the middlemen, the aggregators are sitting at the same table and trying to figure things out. Hmm. Probably started slow, just uh, standards, you know, DEA kind of uh, you know specs uh, 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 hmm. uh, people should use in doing the APIs. But I think naturally they will just move on to uh, what kind of uh, you know ownership should be in place, right? Ownership should be structure should be in place, and what kind of liability model should be in place. So I think broadly speaking, Google's and Facebook's world. I have no idea how that's going to work, but I think in the financial services. Yeah. I, I'm a little bit more uh, optimistic that uh, I share that. Yeah. I share that optimism. Yeah, because I think this is more about the, the trust that um, Melissa's talking about. I think it's a bigger issue for financial services right. than it is for others. Mm -hmm. but, but I just want to make sure we can clear about one thing. The, uh, the FTX, the APIs that the large institutions had built uh, are supposedly only about technical specifications right. on data flow. Right. They are about data fields, yeah. and they define what data will actually flow. Sure. So even right there, the idea that we're seeing you know, industry in here besides the top, that we are seeing <laughs> industry and the big name institutions be fully open uh, about what data and enabling it to flow, which is slightly different than consent. I think we have to be realistic about already what we're seeing, which whether it's competitive purposes, they don't want their competitors knowing what data flows. Like, it, it's already not what a true consumer would argue is ideal. So, Sophie, do we have time for the last two questions? One. one more. So. We can vote on which, which question to <laughs> do. Um, they're kind of similar. Yeah, they're pretty similar. Actually. All right, why don't we do this one? This one. Um, Oh, I think I just do. Okay. Uh, okay. In addition to personal data rights, which of the following is likely to most dramatically impact the ability of individuals to exert greater control over their data? A, greater U.S. federal and state government supervision and enforcement. B, enhanced permissioning functionality for users. D, or C, industry standards for data access and portability, or D, other. Yeah, so whereas the other ones are focused more on stakeholders, this is focused more on what the intervention should be. And if you don't like this question, we can do the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so yeah, similar to the other one, um, industry standards. <laughs> All right, well, okay, so some have voted for D and some have voted for E, which is pretty interesting. But <laughs> yeah, other, D, who picked D? Other? Yeah, yeah. Christina. If I had confidence that supervision and enforcement would work, then Wells Fargo would have had one scandal. And so when I look at the other options, I, I was torn between C and D, and what I really think needs to happen is actually the state level laws that we referenced in the earlier question, is that that's my D, is it's not really about supervision and enforcement, it's actually coming up with a data minimization law or some, and some tool for really preventing the type of sweeping sharing that you saw yesterday that was exposed in what the Wall Street Journal article yesterday. Mm -hmm. I think we're a few minutes over over time. Does anyone else have any other comments on this, or just generally? Thank you. Thank you.